I mean, I've studied Hitler a lot, and there's a bunch of things that you can't say about him. You can't say he was stupid. Right. You can't say he was without artistic talent. Adolf Hitler was a talented artist, Dr. Jordan B. Peterson likes to remind us. So of the many things you can't say about him, you can't say he was without artistic talent. Oh, sure, Hitler was a chaotic and angry guy, but that's because he was a frustrated art student who got rejected from art school. Poor Hitler. Hitler, he's kind of a chaotic guy, you know. He's very angry. He's angry in part because he was a frustrated art student. He tried to get into art school like four times, so really the person to blame for World War II was the four-person committee that wouldn't let poor Hitler into the, I believe it was the Viennese School of Art, because he really wanted to go. You know, and he had some artistic talent. He was a little on the conventional side, by all appearances, but, you know, I've seen some of his sketches, and, you know, he wasn't a complete piker, and he kind of felt maybe it would be okay for him to go to university, because he'd just been through World War I, you know, and that wasn't much fun. So, anyways, he didn't get into art school. I wouldn't say that he was particularly educated, but he had a very powerfully developed aesthetic sense, and he spent a lot of his time designing the cities that would be built after World War II was over, and those cities were generally conceptualized by him as places where the arts, or at least the Nazi version of the arts, could flourish. Peterson would know all about how Hitler enjoyed spending his time poring over plans for future cities, while actual cities in the Third Reich were flattened by British and American bombs, because he has read a book by Frederick Spotts called Hitler and the Power of Aesthetics. How do I know this? Because in Jordan Peterson's autohagiography, The Rise of Jordan Peterson, we can see the Bible on the professor's bookshelf and jammed against a copy of Hitler and the Power of Aesthetics. After all, if you're a Christian, as Peterson pretends to be, in order to recruit the gullible, you'd put your copy of the good book next to one about Hitler, would you not? Hitler and the Power of Aesthetics contains sardonic chapter titles like The Artful Leader and The Master Builder. It begins with a photo of Hitler hunched over a large model, followed by a preface, which reads, There he sits, deep in thought, studying a grand model of his hometown of Linz. The model shows the city as it will look after being transformed into the cultural center of Europe. It had been delivered the day before. The date is February the 13th, 1945. The place is the bunker, under the Reich Chancellery, in Berlin. The Russians are at the Oder, a hundred miles away. The British and Americans are near the Rhine, some 300 miles to the west. Yet Hitler spends hours absorbed in his model. He worries that the bell tower in the center of town will be too tall. It must not eclipse the spire of the cathedral, but must be high enough to catch the first beams of sun in the morning. In the tower, I want a carillon to play, a theme from Bruckner's Fourth, the Romantic Symphony, he tells his architect. During the weeks and months to follow, the model will continue to offer him solace, even after his Reich collapses around him. Peterson never talks about the devastation inflicted on Germany by the Allies in retaliation for Hitler's brutal war and genocide. Put another way, he doesn't discuss the chaos Hitler provoked, but rather the order he brought. Again and again, Peterson presents Hitler as orderly, organized, hygienic, intelligent, a skilled orator, a leader adept at channeling willpower, and an aficionado of quality art. And Hitler was also extremely interested in art, but he categorized art into like proper hygienic art and improper chaotic art, and he often would have art exhibits at the same time of the approved art that he approved of, so those were in the official museums, let's say, and then there would be a corresponding exhibit of degenerate art, and that, that was art that was associated with movements like Expressionism, for example, which has garish colors, and it's very emotionally expressive. Hitler sort of preferred kind of eroticized Greco-Roman representations of heroic people, you know, that was the Nazi aesthetic, essentially. Peterson says Hitler was extremely interested in art. What a coincidence, because Peterson is extremely interested in art, mostly related to authoritarianism and mass murder. He has said he owns 400 pieces of Soviet art, which, according to his book, Twelve Rules for Life, fills every single wall of his house, including ceilings and even the bathrooms. As Peterson has explained, the Soviet portrait next to his desk in his upstairs study depicts five people waiting to be executed. I bought that, and then I found this painting that's actually off to my left here, and it's five Russian revolutionaries, all young, and, and 
quite stalwart looking, standing on the edge of a cliff with a, a red soldier or a white soldier off to the side. They're all shackled together and he's preparing to execute them. Moving on, you might be interested to know that Hitler admired Soviet art, admitting the art of the Bolshevik agitators bore rich fruit, and the Bolshevization of art is the only cultural form of life and the only spiritual manifestation of which Bolshevism is capable. If Bolshevik art was good enough for Hitler, it's good enough for Peterson. Now let's revisit what Peterson said about official Nazi art. Hitler sort of preferred kind of eroticized Greco-Roman representations of heroic people. You know, that was the Nazi aesthetic, essentially. Ah, yes. Hitler liked eroticized versions of Greco-Roman people. And by people, Peterson meant men. For example, Hitler was smitten with a statue called the Discopolis, or disc thrower, gifted to him by Mussolini. At an art exhibit featuring the Discopolis, Hitler said to attendees, May none of you fail to go to the sculpture gallery to see the Discopolis. May you all then realize how glorious man already was back in his corporeal beauty, and that we can speak of progress only if we have attained like perfection or managed to surpass this level. So, the Discopolis represented perfection, and the Germans needed to aspire toward this perfection. How interesting, because in Twelve Rules, Peterson includes a picture of Michelangelo's David and says, Michelangelo's great, perfect, marble David cries out to its observer, You could be more than you are. So, David is perfect, and Peterson's readers ought to aspire toward this perfection. Purportedly, after relations between Hitler and Mussolini soured, Hitler hoped to steal Michelangelo's David and add it to his collection in Linz. Until that happened, the Nazis would have to make do with a statue they created called Readiness, as seen on the left, which was modeled on David, as seen on the right. Readiness was meant to epitomize Aryan indomitability. But of course, Peterson has never linked David to authoritarianism. Well, okay, he has. I guess we didn't talk about this one. You know, that's, a, that's not a copy, that's an original. And that's... There's a bit of the statue of David in this one, I think, because the, the hands are quite um, exaggerated in size, you know. And that, at least in principle, gives the figure more power, because hands are so powerful. So, I mean, obviously he's about on a podium. He's about the same size as me in representation, but his hands are at least 50% bigger than they would be in real life. So it's kind of an interesting technique. So... Yes, it's an interesting propaganda technique. A resolute man with a prominent or enlarged hand set against Soviet-style imagery. How intriguing. Jordan Peterson is fond of citing George Orwell's claim that all art is propaganda. This is a virtual admission that when he shows people art, he is doing so for propagandistic purposes. Take this seemingly innocuous painting he has shown of Jesus and Mary. He does so to venerate Hitler, who produced this portrait of Jesus and Mary. Remember Peterson saying, You know, and he had some artistic talent. He was a little on the conventional side, by all appearances, but, you know, I've seen some of his sketches. Also, the Nazis used similar images, that is, idealized renditions of Aryan women nursing their Aryan babies. If you're thinking that no one would make the connection between Peterson's Jesus and Mary portrait and the one painted by Hitler, I would agree, but by showing such artwork, Peterson is paying tribute to his spiritual master and fulfilling his duty as a preacher of the Nazi faith, which he often does by communicating via the medium of crypto-fascism. Furthermore, Peterson is nuts, hence his warped fascination with Hitler, Lenin, Stalin, Mao, and mass shooters, such as the Columbine killers. He's an absolute lunatic. Indeed, with Jordan Peterson, the layers of lunacy and iniquity are never-ending. For example, in the clips you saw of him talking about Hitler and art, he orally plagiarized Hitler at least four times. Let's do a brief comparative analysis. Peterson. Hitler had a very powerfully developed aesthetic sense, and he spent a lot of time designing the cities that would be built after World War II. Hitler. This will be done in due consideration of aesthetic conditions and the needs of the cities and of traffic flow, and this is how it will be done in this city. Peterson. Those cities were generally conceptualized by Hitler as places where the arts, 
or at least the Nazi version of the arts, could flourish. Hitler, blossoming and flourishing. German art can blossom new and strong. The new German Reich will bring about a tremendous blossoming in German art. Peterson, Hitler had some artistic talent. Hitler, my obvious talent for drawing. Peterson, Hitler categorized art into, like, proper hygienic art and improper chaotic art. Hitler, speaking at an art exhibit, we must guard against Bolshevization, in other words, the chaotic infiltration of our entire German and hence cultural life. When Peterson became famous, journalists took photos of him posing grandiosely with his communist art, but they made no mention of his Nazi art. I wonder why. Here's an example of Peterson's Nazi-themed art on the left, in the hallway leading to his office. Here's the same portrait from another angle. And one more. The CBC shot footage of that painting and said nothing. If you asked a Jordan Peterson fan why he had Nazi art on his wall, they would probably inform you that what you were saying wasn't true. But then Peterson himself might deny it, as he did in an interview with Big Think. Like I, in, my, in my house, I have a very large collection of socialist realist paintings from the former Soviet Union. Propaganda pieces, but also kind of, of, of harsh impressionist pieces of working class people and so forth. And I collected them for a variety of reasons. Now, you could debate about the propriety of that, given the murderousness of those regimes. And fair enough, I have my reasons. But I don't have paintings from the Nazi area, era in my house. And I wouldn't. And that's been a puzzlement to me. He's puzzled about why he doesn't have Nazi art that he has. Jordan Peterson has been lauding Nazi aesthetics since at least 1999, the year he published his first book, Maps of Meaning, which he says is based on the Holocaust, but which has little to say about that historical event. And there are only a handful of direct references to Hitler or the Nazis. Here's one of them. Nazi guards made concentration camp life deathly harsh for the sake of the sheer aesthetic quality. Right, so not only was Hitler a talented artist, but his underlings at concentration camps were deathly harsh in an artistic sense. Am I misreading this? Not at all. In fact, Peterson has said repeatedly that the Holocaust was art. Be aware that since at least 1996, Peterson has been claiming that all of his work is predicated on the Holocaust. But in the talk you will see him give in the following clip, from around 2005, he says his area of expertise is not the Holocaust, but rather the subject of evil. Why tell one audience that he's an expert on the Holocaust, and another that his primary focus is on the nature of evil? He's a chronic, compulsive, around-the-clock liar. Evil is more pernicious than that which is generated, for example, by social inequality. I think it's actually, although this is a terrifying thought in some ways, it's more appropriate to consider it a form of uh, demonically warped aesthetic. And I'll give you a couple of examples of what I mean by that, for example, because the, exa because the manifestation of this warped aesthetic, aesthetic makes itself apparent under certain conditions. So, for example, I think it made itself apparent in the imagination of the first politician who, con who coined the acronym uh, MAD, or Mutual Assured Dis Destruction. That's an aesthetic of evil, to, to make a joke of a, a situation that catastrophic indicates the kind of malevolence that lurks behind the fact that such a condition exists. The motto on the gates of Auschwitz, I believe, in the Second World War, uh, work will make you free. You will have noted how he said, the sign on the gates of Auschwitz, I believe, as if he's uncertain where he saw the sign. How could he be, given his claims that all of his lectures, speeches, books, etc. are about the Holocaust? That's another manifestation of the aesthetic of evil. It's a terrible, terrible, ironic joke. And it, it, it's instructive to meditate on what sort of imagination would have the arrogance to tell such a terrible joke. The concentration camps are classic examples of evil. Classic examples of evil. So, would that be classic good or classic bad? 
I think by an analyzing at least certain kinds of events that occurred within them, it's easier to get a clear idea of what evil constitutes. And one, one of the stories that's always haunted me, I guess, is I believe it's another story derived from Auschwitz. He believes it's another story from Auschwitz, so maybe it is, he says, just before relaying it in detail. The prison guards in Auschwitz would take the prisoners, who were already stripped of their dignity and to whatever degree possible their identity and their culture and their language and their status of, as valuable beings, and yet that wasn't sufficient. They needed to be tortured in addition to that before they were killed. And the torture often consisted of uh, self-evidently counterproductive work. Uh, uh, a situation that also frequently characterized activity in the Soviet Gulag Archipelago where perhaps 60 million people met their death. A typical Auschwitz example was the requirement for prisoners to carry 100 pound sacks of wet salt from one side of the compound and then back again. Now that's evil as far as I'm concerned and, and you have to think about it from an aesthetic perspective in a sense because it's a celebration of horror. Okay, so evil is a demonically warped aesthetic, and we can deduce that this hellish artistic quality was present at Auschwitz because it was a classic example of evil, and working Jews to death represented a celebration of horror. Prior to Peterson's I believe it happened at Auschwitz spiel, he discussed his lifelong obsession with evil, which was sparked by long-lasting and hyper-realistic nightmares about nuclear detonations which kept going off in his mind. He then spoke about what he learned about evil from a book about the devil. I probably spent my whole life trying to understand what evil was and, more importantly, what might be done about it. Um, it's a strange pursuit in some ways for an academic to un undertake because academics tend to talk about academic things. And one thing you can say about evil is that whatever it is, it's not bloody well academic. Like, it, it's not an intellectual issue. It's an existential issue. And it's, it's not a theoretical issue, it's an, it's an issue that deals with the, the absolute nature of reality. And I guess sometimes I think that people who go into academia go into academia to shield themselves from having to ask questions about the absolute nature of reality. So, anyways, I think before you can talk about something, before you can dare to talk about something like evil, you should do some thinking about what it is that you're talking about definitionally speaking. and I learned this, I believe, from a historian named Jeffrey Burton Russell, who wrote a very detailed history of the idea of the devil in the 1980s when such histories were, were strange, to say the least. He, he was very interested in the history, the embodiment of ideas of evil. If you asked a million of Peterson's adherents what his lifelong academic pursuit was, I doubt even one of them could tell you. Sadly, the same could be said of his critics and journalists. When Peterson was just a bushwhacker from rural Alberta, trying to sound brainy by using transitional phrases like definitionally speaking and appearing on tiny TV Ontario, the public didn't need to know about his chief interest. But now he's the leader of an immense international cult and spends his time emulating what he learned from a history of Lucifer, that is, the embodiment of the ideas of evil. Which is to say, Peterson is the embodiment of the ideas of evil. He's not a self-help guru, which is what he rebranded himself as around 2015, but a self-harm guru whose overarching interest is evil, not its prevention, but its propagation. Now let's watch Peterson in 2017 giving a so-called biblical lecture to the public. Right, you know, one of the things I've always thought about Hitler is that, you know, people you have to admire Hitler, that's the thing. Because he was an organizational genius. Like I know in the academy and in, among intellectual circles for decades, the idea of evil has been, it's like, what are you, medieval or something? You know, the whole idea of evil, you don't, that's a non-starter as an intellectual starting place, as a, as a topic. And that's something that I've just been unable to understand because I cannot understand how you could possibly have more than a cursory knowledge of the history of the 20th century. Much, much less a deep knowledge of the history of the 20th century. And, and to walk away with any other conclusion than, well, good might not exist, but evil, hey, the evidence for that is 
so overwhelming that, that only willful blindness could possibly explain denying in its existence. And that was actually a useful discovery for me, because I also concluded, perhaps, that if it was true evil existed, then it, it was true by inference that its opposite existed. This is a good example of Peterson all but admitting that he's a psychopath. The existence of evil, which in the TV Ontario video he characterized as having to do with the absolute nature of reality, was what impelled him to infer that there was such a thing as good. Put another way, he couldn't see good, couldn't relate to it, but he knew it must be there because he could see evil, for example in his nightmares and all the books he read about atrocities. Oh, and he could feel evil as well, coursing through his veins in the form of rage, narcissistic rage, which we can hear percolating in his throat whenever he denigrates women's studies or human rights or claims there's no such thing as white privilege, which we can catch glimpses of whenever someone comes close to revealing his true identity, that of a Nazi. Because the opposite of evil, let's say the evil of the concentration camp, let's say, or we could get more specific about it, we could say there's this one thing that used to happen in Auschwitz where they would take people off the incoming trains, those who lived, you know, that weren't stacked around the outside of the train train uh, uh, cars and you know froze to death because it was too cold you know those who only had to be stuck in the middle where it was warm enough so that maybe the old people died because they suffocated but at least some of them were alive when they made it to Auschwitz and then they took those poor people out one of the tricks that the guards used to play on them was to have the the newly arrived prisoners hoist like hundred pound sacks of wet salt and carry them from one side of the compound and these compounds were big. This was a city. It wasn't like a gymnasium. It was like a city. There were tens of thousands of people there. They'd have them carry the sack of wet salt from one side of the compound to the other and then back. Right? And that was to make a mockery out of the notion that work would set you free. It's like, no, no, you work here, but there's nothing productive about it. The whole point, it's exactly the opposite of sacrifice in some sense. It's so we're going to make you act out working, but all it will do is speed your demise. And maybe we can decorate it up a little bit, because not only will it speed up your demise, it will do it in a very painful way, while simultaneously increasing the probability that other people's demises will be painful and sped up. It's a work of art, that's for sure. In addition to the Jews' painful demise being a work of art, a certain collector of propagandistic art that helped facilitate genocide has admitted on multiple occasions that he could have participated in this art. He informed an audience in Vancouver that he could have done so while feeling happiness and deeply satisfied. Here's another such example, made when Peterson was being interviewed by Joe Rogan. The related video is no longer available. Peterson, it's easy to envision myself taking someone who just got off a transport train and have them carry a 100 pound sack of wet salt from one side of the compound to the other. People don't like to picture themselves doing that because it's too frightening, but I know perfectly well that I could do that sort of thing, and maybe I could even enjoy it. We live in a time where, on the world's most watched podcast, the world's most popular public intellectual can admit that he could work Jews to death and possibly enjoy it, and no one seems to find this alarming. On that cheery note, let's conclude with a psychology lecture from 2017 given at the University of Toronto. Peterson will begin by misquoting Friedrich Nietzsche, from whom Adolf Hitler, Joseph Goebbels, and company got their idea of the overman, or ubermensch, who would have to eliminate the subhumans, or untermenschen. Recall Peterson saying that the Nazi aesthetic was derived from representations of heroic people. As you watch this, please observe Peterson's odd manner and irritated tone, an indicator of the rage I alluded to earlier, and remember that he said he could work Jews to death and maybe enjoy it. Nietzsche said that if you had a, a why, you could bear any how. And that's, that's good. One of the things that the Auschwitz guards used to do to the prisoners, and this is very telling, so at Auschwitz there was a sign that said, work will make you free. It was a little joke. N not really a very funny joke. 
you know, it's the kind of joke that you have to be satanic is the appropriate term to conceptualize and to dare to, to, to state. So when the Auschwitz prisoners came to Auschwitz, you know, they're already pretty, pretty rough shape. They were in cattle cars. They'd been separated from their families. Everything had been taken from them. They were transported for a long time. They were standing up. The kids were suffocating because there was no room in the, you know, it was so packed in there. They didn't have anything to eat. There weren't any toilet facilities of any sort. It was like you got rid of 20% of the people just transporting them. You know, the ones on the outside of the cars, they froze to death because, of course, it was cold and pretty nasty. And then when they got to Auschwitz, the guards used to have this game that they would play. And this is part of the work will set you free thing. They would get a prisoner, they'd take a prisoner who's already in pretty, you know, pretty rough shape. He says with a laugh, he has a head full of mental illness and is unquestionably a psychopath. And then have them carry a sack of wet salt, 100 pounds, from one side of the camp to the other. And, you know, when you think of a camp, you think of something like a football field, you know, maybe something that big, fences around. It's like, no way, man, these were cities, these were... There were tens of thousands of people in these places. So from one side of the camp compound to the other, that was a good hike. And that wasn't bad enough. They had to get them to carry it back and put it in the same place. Now, that's poetic in its malevolence. That's poetic in its malevolence. Working Jewish men to death, because after they could no longer function, they would be sent to the gas chambers, after telling them that work would make them free, was satanic, and a kind of poetry. This is not the only instance Peterson has spoken about Auschwitz and poetry. In 12 Rules for Life, the best-selling self-help book that contains a lengthy quote from Mein Kampf, Peterson writes about Theodor Adorno, one of the founding members of the Frankfurt School, which promoted something called critical theory. Peterson writes, After Auschwitz, said Theodor Adorno, student of authoritarianism, there should be no poetry. He was wrong, but the poetry should be about Auschwitz. Do you get it? It's a little joke. Not a very funny joke. After Peterson shot to stardom by falsely claiming that Canada had compelled speech laws, he often railed against the Frankfurt School. But then he would, because Adorno and most of the other founding members were Jewish. What Peterson means is, there ought to be poetry about Auschwitz that exalts the torture and deaths of 1.1 million Jews. Jordan Peterson is Canada's foremost neo-Nazi organizer, a fact completely missed by the Canadian media, something I consider unforgivable. I would kindly ask that you share this video in order to raise awareness of this grouse oversight. I would also ask that you consider reading The Devil and His Due, How Jordan Peterson Plagiarizes Adolf Hitler. Thank you for watching and listening, and bye for now.